Okay, well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Jennifer. So glad to be here. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Let's try that again. I'm not sure if I caught this recording. So go for it again. <laughs> thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see <laughs> so many faces that are friendly and a lot of new faces in the crowd. This is great. So um, I've got a lot of slides to go through, probably too many, so I'll get at them. And most of them are from 2009 towards the curtain. I've got them in uh, chronological order, but I put a few from before that just to give a little bit of a background to what I was doing in Winnipeg before I went to Toronto to go to grad school. So mostly what I was doing is I was walking around taking pictures of things that nowadays you might put on Instagram, but back then I would um, photograph interesting street scenes and then I would paint them uh, either on the hardcover, um, hard covers of, of books that I would tear off the book and then paint on the hardcover in oil or on canvases. And so the one we have here is uh, it's a pawn shop and I just kind of thought that all these images kind of look like, um, remind me of modern day cave paintings, almost like pictographs of desired things. So instead of an Ibex or an elk, you'd have uh, a diamond or a DVD player. So things like that, a lot, of, lot to do with the history of Winnipeg and, um, and place, where Winnipeg's at these days, a lot of stuff about industry and its history. Growing up along the river, and I've also for a long time just been doing more joke kind of stuff. So a lot of works on paper. So here we have uh, um, Marcel Duchamp's fountain signature on a piece of paper with a, um, a dog that I painted uh, with ink. A mutt. Although it's not a mutt really, it's a, a German Shepherd which is a purebred mutt. So some jokes are in there. And then I went to Toronto to do my grad school there at York University. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know, whenever you go to grad school, you're trying to kick it up a notch, get into some new stuff. So I started off um, with the same kind of methods, the tactics of the flaneur, walking around the streets and finding interesting street scenes, looking for inspiration. And I started doing some more close-up kind of material studies almost. So I'd find things like this in the back alley. And this is a uh, uh, kind of an aluminum siding with the image of barnwood printed on it, which is kind of weird because they could have printed anything on the aluminum siding, but they used like an old ratty barnwood image. And uh, so that's nailed up there and then I got some chain link fence on it. So I was doing that, walking around, uh, and then I decided to inject a little more rigor and figure out what I was going to do for the thesis. I started to look um, more into the history of the, the spaces that I was kind of drawn to. So this is the corner of uh, the Dufferin subway station. And then I looked into it and it's built in 1968 along with a lot of other stuff in Toronto like the C&E and well there's was, was a huge building boom back then so so a lot of the stuff had a similar look <clears throat> and used a lot of the similar materials a lot of this uh, kind of terrazzo tile and then I found this place and this is the uh, Woodrow apartment complex in Parkdale and I found it walking along the train tracks I live not too far from there. And I was pretty interested in this place, so I looked into its history. And it had a kind of a neat one. So uh, it's built 1963, the same year as the Toronto City Hall. And they were built very similar. They had the same uh, kind of two semicircles facing each other with a courtyard in the middle. Um, this one had a beautiful courtyard with a big modernist fountain in the middle and um, huge circular donut shaped uh, kind of UFO. Um, weather guards over top of the doorways. And when it was new, it was uh, meant to be kind of a new way of living back in the late 50s, early 60s. The apartment building allowed you to have um, a fully contained um, kind of metropolitan living area without having to worry about a yard and a mortgage and stuff like that. So it was freeing to a, a swing-in kind of crowd. And this one had a Canadian celebrity lived in the top floor, uh, Tommy Hunter, the, the country music star. <laughs> He lived up there, so it was that kind of place. So I looked into the history of these kinds of places and I started looking into the Corbusier, um, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and CIAM, the Society International Architects Modern. And these were all the heavy hitters in that, and they were kind of all, well, basically just figuring out a new way to build the world kind of thing, what through their, their visions and their plans. And uh, so it was, it was about architecture, but it was also about street planning and that kind of thing. And they had some pretty neat ideas. Some of them were a little bit crazier, like Corbusier. 
who wanted to tear down a huge part of Paris and build uh, what he called the Garden City, which was a complex, well, not a complex system of towers, but it was a bunch of towers kind of built into a forest, and they had walkways that connected them, maybe even kind of floating walkways and uh, freeways. So it was a lot of green space, and uh, well, it, was, it would have been a travesty if that actually happened, but it did inspire a lot of things that did happen, like this one. And in Toronto back then, they had um, the slum clearances, so they did kick a lot of people out of their smaller houses and built uh, kind of housing complexes and places like this. And this was kind of a neat utopian, not really utopian, well, the, a lot of the housing complexes were, but um, and this one had some neat ideas about new ways to live in a city. But it fell on disrepair in the 70s and 80s. There was a, two brothers that bought it, and they figured out a rule where you don't have to fix a place if it's uh, within three years of you buying it. So what they did was every three years they'd sell it back and forth to each other until the government told them they couldn't do that. So then they sold it to their mother. And they weren't the greatest tenants. They fixed nothing in the place and it fell into ruin. <clears throat> Recently, the, uh, it's kind of neat, the tenants all got together and formed a tenant union and they had a rent strike in there until things were brought up to code a little bit. And one neat story I found was in 1994, uh, the police went to a call for a break and enter on the top floor, and they found a, uh, a marijuana grow operation inside the apartment, the suite. And they said there was enough mud to fill a farmer's field in there, and there was tons of wiring and tons of lights. And then they found a big hole burrowed through the concrete floor, which had a whole bunch of wires and a whole bunch of pipes going through it. So they followed that to the suite below, and they found another grow up in there and another hole through the floor and they followed a chain of holes and, and they, all in all they found 12 full apartments, like three bedroom apartments <laughs> filled with marijuana grow operations and it took them weeks to get all the mud out of there. They said it was, it was like there was a huge farm inside uh, an urban apartment building, which is kind of a crazy thing. And there was people living right next to all these places so everyone had to keep quiet about it until someone broke in and that's when it all kind of got busted. So uh, that was a good story and I wanted to make some work about that, but there was no way for me to get in there to photograph it. So this is when I started making um, the models. So from the police report and from um, just the, the plans of the building and from going to visit the building and figuring out how things would have looked. I reconstructed a marijuana grow operation inside the apartment. So first I made an apartment <clears throat> with the floral wallpaper and the floral couch. And I have a barbecue grate as the, uh, the balcony railing and a working sliding door. And then I cut up the tiles to make little, little, littler tiles. So once I had the apartment ready, and then I put the grow operation in, and this is a photograph that just recently was uh, on auction at the platform fundraiser. So this is a photo of the grow operation. I have a big 1,000-watt uh, thousand, thousand metal halide lights. I built them out of uh, plastic spoons. So that's what those are. i got little beer cups. Uh, tin foil is the plastic sheeting, little miniature 2 by 4s And mud was in there, of course. <clears throat> and then I used that as the basis for a painting. And so this is the painting that came out of that. And this is when I started uh, well, building the models and trying to figure out if they were good to paint from. And they, they started to work pretty good. And I was at York and they had a huge production studio so I could put them in the big black room, kind of light them professionally like little movie sets more or less. Mm -hmm. So I got the nice backlight coming through and I was experimenting with that sort of thing. And I was doing a lot of paintings on smaller pieces of wood. So they were good. So I, I could work through ideas fairly quickly with them. Although these small paintings, I get into the details and then I end up working just as long on a small painting as I would on a big one. But anyway, so this one had a lot of glazing to it. Layers and layers of thin, thinly applied oil. And there's another photo. So this is uh, the paper fan that I built with a little light on top. Some boards in the background. <clears throat> so were these large scale pieces, these last two, or were they the smaller ones? These two are both on wood. They're both small, small paintings on uh, primed wood. Yeah. 
So the things that we're working on these paintings, I was finding from the models, was uh, the angles were interesting. They were kind of neat. So like this last one, you get kind of a, almost like a bird's eye view or a out of body experience kind of view or a, kind of like a surveillance type of thing. And I wasn't sure how to show, um, kind of show show how it was, what was happening. Because if you paint a painting from a room with loose brush strokes, you can't tell if it's a model or the painting. I was thinking. Uh, so I did things like I put in a little bit of the plywood at the top, as kind of a hint, things like that. Then as I went on, I realized I didn't have to do that as much. Uh, just the angles were different and the details were different. So the, the, where the leg meets the, the table there, you can see a little bit of glue. So I'd try and focus in on the details like that, the little um, scrappy details that kind of gave away the painting for what it is, the model for what it is. And that turned out to be part of what made them good paintings. So there's the angles, the details, um, they're theatrical, lighting, camera angles. And I was allowed to set dress them as well. It allowed me to set dress them and control building the image right from the ground up. So I could control every little aspect in the image, which was what I like to do as a little bit of a control freak with this sort of thing. And at the same time, I was still walking around checking stuff out. And I was interested in um, uh, different material types of studies. So I was looking at uh, how the modernists got pretty excited about uh, different types of materials that were new at the time. They had the glass sheeting on the skyscrapers and uh, new things could be done with concrete. So I was looking around to see what modern day um, updates that, that would have been made. So what kind of modernist materials were happening now? What kind of efficient, cheap, cheaply made things they were? And I figured a chain link fence would be about the cheapest way to make any type of a, a fence around a compound or a house and the uh, aluminum siding. So that's what this painting's of. Updated modernist materials. Looks a little bit like a Nanaimo bar too. I kind of thought a little, little bit of a confection. And, uh, and experimenting with different types of, um, there's the painting scenarios. So this is kind of like an all over field of vision or all over pattern that runs off the sides, kind of like a Pollock type of thing. So I was experimenting with that as well. <laughs> and I was on a, a very large campus, York University, just north of Toronto, where there was lots and lots of brutalist influences. So of course I got into that kind of thing. And uh, the brutalism from the French word kind of means like the raw, raw form. It was just the shape of the building was to be the only ornamentation, except for the wood grain that was left over from the forms that were um, used to pour the building. That would be the only ornamentation. And then just the shape of it, what, the way the light fell on it, would be um, the design of the building. And of course, things change and it gets very raw. Very raw. Yeah. yeah, yeah, raw, brutal. Um, very raw. And then the ornamentation that does appear over time is on these things, of course, uh, moss, fungus, <laughs> totally covers them. And uh, this whole huge building is about seven stories. It's a huge wall of concrete. And the only ornamentation that stands out are these big um, plastic owls that they put up to keep the pigeons off, <laughs> which seemed like a pretty fitting ornamentation, I thought. Kind of like the surveillance for birds to scare them away. And at this time, uh, the G20 was happening, and I was reading um, some articles and books by Beatrix Colomina and she had some pretty neat ideas about modernism and media and her theories were that uh, architecture is the architects and modernist architecture is exists more as media than it does as physical objects that the images and the models and the media that surrounded them as they were being built was more important to the architects than the actual images or the actual buildings so some of her examples were like the Barcelona Pavilion, the German um, Pavilion in Barcelona, um, back in 1937, and uh, how Mies van der Rohe designed that, and it's still one of the most influential pieces of modernist architecture, but it only existed for about three months, and then they tore it down, and it existed only as a photograph. So that was kind of her 
her example that the photograph is more powerful than the actual building and that once they were once they were photographed they were, weren't really necessary or they didn't really have much concern for how they were to be used which did prove to be the case for a lot of the different apartment blocks and office structures that were built around that time and this one, this building here, is Mies van der Rohe's TD Center in Toronto, and that was built in 1963. And it's a great big black uh, megalith. And this was the uh, largest building in Western Canada, actually in all of Canada when it was built back then, for the biggest bank. And this is this is where I get a little bit conspiracy theory on it. <laughs> so. During the G20, I was walking around, and uh, the Saturday there was almost like a, a block party kind of atmosphere around downtown Toronto. Everyone was out with their families, and they were walking along, and then the, uh, the riot police would block off a street, so you just take a right, walk around to the other side, and then they'd block that off, and you just kept walking around, uh, playing that little game. It was kind of nice, taking pictures in front of the line of uh, riot police. And then eventually... Um, an area that they had blocked off, they they kind of let it clear, and there were t a couple of police cars positioned in the middle of the intersection. And this was a little weird because there were no police cars out for the whole run of the G20. The only vehicles they used were these kind of minivans, these Dodge minivans. And they'd drive around and kind of hover out the side like a hobo on a box car, staring at everyone with balaclavas on as they drove around. But there was no police cars, and in this position, there were this day there was two police cars left. And then everyone kind of walked up. And then they just took pictures standing on top of them. And eventually someone lit one on fire and everyone kind of cheered. So it was still like a block party atmosphere. But then when you look at the footage afterwards, it looks like a complete riot. You see downtown Toronto in flames with po police cars burning. So I was thinking of the Beatrix calling me in. And I was thinking if I were a video producer and I wanted footage to kind of justify what was happening at the G20, to be shown on the news every five minutes. I would get a nice videographer to pick the best place to put the police car to be burning. And they picked a really nice spot in front of the, these historic buildings. And then they had to get a nice camera angle and it shot up. It was just beautiful. And so that's a painting about that. But I left the cop car out. That was a little too heavy handed. So just a little bit of smoke. Burning cities, it's always the, this, the signal for dyst in dystopian movies that things are going bad. And I was also making models. This is one of the first ones I built for a uh, for a um, a back and forth thing we were doing at the time in York with uh, the UCAM University. And uh, yeah, so they came to. To a CR school, and they put a show on for us, and did some talks, and then we went to their school and did some talks, and uh, and put a show on for them. So the art that I brought them was the one room they saw after they came to Toronto to check out the art scene. We spent the whole day in room 138, which was our room. It was not as nice as this one, and I built a little um, model of the corner of the room and the plastic plants that are in there. So they came down there and they spent their time in that room staring at this fake plant. <laughs> so I brought a little memento of that experience to Montreal when we went. And I was which, which university was that? Or Quebec? Ucam, the University of Quebec in Montreal. And I was experimenting with different angles and kind of showing, um, kind of showing in the studio, showing the, that it was an experimental work in progress. So I got the painted floor and the models propped up on a paint can. And try some more exaggerated angles with that. So that's that one. And I always tried to keep them scrappy, I, a little bit. So you can kind of tell that the, the Venetian blinds are made out of beer cans a little bit. But, yeah. And then uh, that leads to this one. And this is a model that I built based on a room at the top floor of that Mies van der Rohe building that we just saw in front of the police cars on fire a couple of frames back. And so this room at the top of the building was designed by Mies van der Rohe to be the party room at the very top of the world, basically. It was the most powerful bank, and they had a party room at the top of their building, the tallest building in Canada, so they could sit up there and smoke cigars and look out across the landscape. And it was a particularly interesting party room because he designed it to remain exactly the same forever. 
So uh, whenever the carpet needed to be replaced, it had to be replaced from the same exact carpet manufacturer in Italy. Uh, the little yellow flowers on the table there, they had to be replaced by the same type of flowers as soon as they died. Um, um, the plants had to remain the same. Uh, the light bulbs had to be the same kind of light bulbs, which is getting a little tougher now that uh, light bulbs are changing. So uh, they're probably store stockpiled quite a bit there. And this was in uh, um, Doors Open Toronto. Usually let you in there to see this this um, this kind of time frozen time room. But it wasn't uh, available that year when they had Doors Open Toronto. So I just kind of went up there on the elevator, did a little private eye work, and just tried the door, and it opened. So I went and I could hear someone on a conference call in the next room to Italy. <laughs> so I quietly just snuck around taking pictures. And as soon as I saw this room, I, I knew I wanted to make a kind of panoramic style painting of it, but I wasn't sure what to do with it. And none of the photos worked out um, very interesting to do anything with. And uh, the models had been working a little bit, so I decided to do that. And I picked a nice v angle, nice view from the outside of the building. So that allowed me to put in the little black uh, girders that would identify it as a, a Mies van der Rohe building from the era. And it was also kind of a neat frame that you wouldn't be able to get normally. So you'd need a helicopter to get this kind of shot because it's on the 54th floor. Uh, and it also breaks up the frame kind of interestingly. So it kind of breaks it up into six sections. And I tried to make each section interesting to itself so that one wouldn't be a kind of a dud and have a bunch of stuff crammed into the other one. So to do that, I set it up all in, I had all the, um, all the items, and it's all, it's all very accurate to what's in the real room. There's a reappel up on the wall that's been tilted a little bit. I built that one small. And the plants are the same, the table's the same, the little Barcelona chairs I made from uh, stripper pant material. It's kind of a really thin, elastic, fake leather. So it worked really good to make miniature Barcelona chairs. Uh, so I set it up um, kind of in a cinematic way. I set it up uh, looking through the camera. So I'd set up the camera and I set up the model in a big black room. And then I'd move all the little things around and kind of designed it so that it looked good from the one angle. And I wasn't really concerned with how it looked other than that. And that's what I ended up with. And then I made the painting of that right there. <laughs> and uh, at this time I was reading also Marshall Berman, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air. It's a pretty neat book and he, he explains in part of it the, the modernism goes, has been going on for quite a while. It's kind of since industrialization and it's the process of what's there at the time being kind of destroyed and rebuilt on, on the ashes of that. And then whatever that is gets destroyed and they rebuild on the ashes of that. And modernism is essentially just a, a continuous, um, continuous system of this happening. Um, Till you get people like Mies van der Rohe who kind of buy into that um, progress, but at the same time see their designs as um, immortal in a way. Almost like he's, his only competition is the Parthenon is how they kind of saw it. So. <laughs> So they would build these these buildings to last forever as the perfect the perfect structure, and there was nothing really exemplified that quite like this room that he actually wrote in the contract had to stay exactly the same forever. So I went in there and I, I made the model and and had a little bit of a, a kind of a Christmas party, I tore it up a little bit because it's kind of a neat idea, although maybe a little bit flawed. And. At that time, I was also making this painting, and that last one was uh, nine feet long by five feet tall, so it was quite a big painting. Yeah. Uh, then we have the parking garage. This is five feet tall by seven feet long, another big one, and that's the same dimensions as that uh, earlier apartment building with the white sky in the background. So this was a companion piece to that one as well. It. Um, it's based on the apartments, uh, that, that apartment's parking garage. So the bricks, the pattern bricks, I kind of cut them out of tar paper and I shone a light in that production room, threw them to get the nice silhouettes strafing across the floor there. Um, and then the cement pillars, 
would have the, the pattern left on them from cardboard sono tubes or can, um, cement pouring tubes. So I built, I built them. I made them out of uh, toilet paper rolls, pretty much. And then I got a little toy truck and some uh, miniature bags. They were, originally when I made it, those were bags of dirt was the plan. And this was to be a truck pulled up and delivering dirt to the, uh, to the girl operation. Because how do you deliver that much dirt to a place without anybody noticing? It's kind of funny. And uh, this painting, doo -doo -doo -doo. well, I guess I should say it's important to me that the paintings remain a little bit ambiguous, and I just like to kind of put in the ingredients into the painting and leave it open purposefully as much as I can to multiple readings from the viewer. So I do quite a bit of research on them, and I have a little plan for them to inter uh, interrelate in certain ways, but it's not necessary for the viewer to know all of that. I don't put a lot of that forward. I don't put a big didactic storyline. So this doesn't even need to be tied into the apartment building to me. But uh, when they're in the same room, they do interact in certain ways. So that's what this one is. It could be either the early day sun coming in at an angle like that, or it could be a searchlight, or it could be a street light. And then the pattern kind of gives a hint at uh, the type of modernist bricks. So you get a, an idea of the era. Uh, the truck is not parked in a regular stall, so it implies maybe a, an emergency parking job or maybe even an accident. And then things are strewn out, so maybe it's being packed in a hurry or unpacked in a hurry. Or maybe the door got popped open. Maybe there's a robbery. So there are different, different things like that and different colorations. With the blue light coming in, that could be maybe car headlights coming in, or just kind of leave it open. And there's a picture of the model. And at this time I was also um, getting interested in the Bauhaus, because a lot of this modernist stuff uh, tended to come out of that, it seemed. So I was looking into um, uh, kind of the early classes of the Bauhaus called the Vorkers. Vorkers and they were kind of the precursor to the basic design classes that are taught in art schools these days. But, but they were invented there by Itten, and he kind of designed them and ran them for quite a few years, and they were very helpful. What's the uh, professor again? Itten. Itten. Yeah. I think it's Johannes Itten, but right. okay. yeah. And he was a little bit of a wacky guy. He belonged to some kind of a sect, and he had a shaved head, and they would do elaborate breathing exercises before the class, and he encouraged his students to wear robes with a big sun on them, kind of like a wizard cloak. <laughs> but it was neat. That was the kind of the cool thing that was happening in the early Bauhaus, was there a lot, of, a lot of experimentation, and they gave a lot of freedom to people with strange ideas, um, which I think is par partly mostly what I'm interested in at the Bauhaus is. They went on to be influential in every aspect of the world with all those skyscrapers and a lot of the design we use now down to the teapots. But it was open for a very short time, only 14 years. There wasn't a ton of students that went through there. And it was an art school. It wasn't even an architecture school at the beginning or a design school. It kind of invented design as it went. But uh, I think a lot of the influential things that happened there were because of the kind of the wackiness and the experimentation that was happening. So that's, that's how I see it. And this one is a piece of paper made into a model, and it's based on a model called Triad in front of a building that's in downtown Toronto near the train station. And so, so it's a remake of that. And the paper model I made is um, kind of a takeoff on um, Joseph Albers' Vorker's class, where he told all the students to make paper sculptures. And if they made them, to mimic other materials, then he would say, no, that's incorrect, that's wrong. It should only, paper should only be used as paper and every material should be used as itself and there's no need for it to mimic other materials. So it's kind of a neat idea that they instilled at the beginning and that would follow through the students' ideas about materials. And that is when I decided uh, to do a project and I wanted to, um, track what happened to all the people from the Bauhaus after the, the Nazis shut it down in 1933. So it was in first Weimar, then Dessau, and then uh, Mies van der Rohe was the director when it was in Berlin for a few years. And that ended in 1933 when it was shut down. 
And then everyone involved kind of left Germany and they went around Europe and they went around North America and they took all these ideas and they spread out with them. And in the case of America, they got a lot more funding for them. So a lot of the ideas that they had might not have been realized if it stayed running in Germany. So people say it's a shame that it was shut down, but in a way it kind of, it's, it's spread to a larger, um, it's, you know, touched a lot more people in that way and got a lot more funding. So a lot of these skyscrapers could happen, like the Seagram's building in New York and things like that. Uh, so yeah, so I wanted to study where these people went and how the Bauhaus ideas spread around the world. So I went and lived in Berlin for a while, as that was the last place that it existed. And I was also looking for modern day manifestations of the Bauhaus theories in and around Berlin and Germany. Uh, up, 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 up. So, um, this one right here, this is a little watercolor that I did. And all the works that I did while I was um, in Berlin are all on paper. So I have some oil paintings and some ink and uh, charcoal drawings and some watercolors. But they're all on paper 29 by 39 centimeters. So pretty good size, but still portable. Um, so I could work on them in different living rooms and uh, borrowed studios as we went. And this one kind of looked like a, well, it was a giant play structure and it was very dangerous as all the play structures are in Germany. They're all very different and very dangerous. This one's about 20 feet tall and it's made out of logs <laughs> painted in the Bauhaus colors, kind of red, yellow, blue. And you'd see little kids up there in their Sunday dresses playing along a log 20 feet in the air while their parents kind of smoked a cigarette <laughs> casually. It was pretty neat to see. And... Uh, so that's that one. That, to me, it looked kind of like a, a Bauhaus student's sculpture. And this is a toy set of the Plattenbau kind of buildings. This is at the, um, the GDR Museum. So this showed what life was like in the former East Germany. And uh, this is a play set of Plattenbau, which is a slab block type of architecture that they used, kind of influenced by the early Bauhaus plans for... Um, for efficient, efficient, cost-effective living systems. They were all about building domestic houses for German workers, basically, and um, in ways that were kind of new ways, cost-effective ways. They could house the most people to make a machine for living, is how they put it. So in the beginning, they were working pretty good as these uh, preformed cement blocks were raised up and attached, kind of like a giant Lego set. And a little bit of the um, uh, kind of the propaganda that they'd, they'd, they'd have toys made, so kids would get used to the ideas of these these platinum bow buildings, and they could build them themselves and have pride in them. So that's an example of that toy set. And there was a big drawer you could pull out, and it showed uh, what it was like inside a platinum bow. So this is. Uh, you pull out the drawer and it had a glass top and it was a little model set up, so I thought that was pretty good. I didn't even have to build the models, they were just already there. So this little kitchen, uh, I showed it to some people who lived in the DDR and they said they recognized it immediately, just not from the wallpaper and the patterns, but that red pot, because there was only limited amounts of objects you could have, and the red pot <laughs> was, was one that they, every single house had that pot, so they knew it right away from that. There's that, and there's the living room. I guess I do like to paint pattern quite a bit, so this was a nice excuse to get some good wallpaper pattern in there. Um, and the living room, I replaced the paintings on the wall with paintings by a Bauhausler named uh, Farkas Molnar. And he was kind of a neat one. His theories were that, and he was not a fairly successful architect at the time, but his theories were that the paintings of buildings that hadn't been built are equally important as the buildings, and it was almost not even necessary to build them. He saw them as equal. And so I used some of his paintings inside there. Of course, I like that guy. And this is the bathroom. And this one kind of brought to mind uh, a Thomas Demand. Uh, and I, I was looking at Thomas Demand naturally because I was making models at the time. And I was in Germany, so you can't ignore Thomas Demand, who makes the life-size rooms out of paper. So everything's out of paper, the tiles, the water, 
the sink and everything, would be made out of paper. And all his stuff um, for 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 this show that he built the bathroom for was called um, uh, National Gallery. So it was kind of all about the collective memory of Germans. And uh, this one is from there's a prominent politician who ended up dead in the bathroom in the bathtub in a suit and it was kind of ingrained in everyone's minds so he took the politician out of the the tub and recreated the bathroom that was in the photo shoot and uh, a lot of his stuff kind of kind of had that it was all murder scenes or something awful that happened in all these locations so when you see his images you kind of just assume it right away that it must be something sinister had happened in that space and i don't know if it's just the way that if you look at a model at a weird angle or something like that, if it implies that something sinister happened, but in his it certainly does. So Your painting, though, of his work takes a different perspective, though? Like, how did you change? I kind of thought of it as sometimes a painting of a bathroom is just a painting of a bathroom. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Because it, this is the typical East German bathroom. It's the one in the little model. So if they, everyone had the same bathroom, they see it, they probably think of their own bathroom just as much as they do the, the one where the guy ended up murdered. That's what I was kind of thinking. Here's a waiting room. The classic Bauhaus chair in front of some wallpaper. <laughs> what's the, what's the uh, references in the architecture in the wallpaper? Uh, that is... That's a CIA listening station on top of Teufelberg, which is uh, it's kind of a neat place. It's a giant pile of rubble left over from World War II. It's one of the highest places in Berlin. They built these huge mountains of all the rubble. And this one was built on top of Albert Speer's built a, uh, a, like a huge spy training camp. And it, he really overbuilt it. The walls were like, I don't know, like 10 feet thick cement. And this, the Americans, when they had that section after the war, they couldn't blow it up. It was too hefty to blow up, so they buried it under all the rubble. And then on top of it, they built a giant listening center. So this was the spy listening center, those big domes or radar listening devices. And there was a part of East Germany, they realized they could listen way better when this uh, big Ferris wheel was up. So, <laughs> so they, they pulled some strings and had it left up permanently, so everyone was wondering why this giant Ferris wheel was left up at way, way long after the fair was done. But that's the reason, and uh, it means Devil Hill, just because it's right next to Devil's Lake. So that's what's on the wallpaper. And there's some more wallpaper, and this is probably the only painting I've done in a long time, uh, just out of my imagination. So you got some wallpaper with some stuff in behind it there. And these are all on the paper. That one, last one is oil, this one's charcoal and ink. It's a typical bar Bauhaus apartment building with the, uh, the signature curved balcony. And uh, made it out of cardboard, and then we were moving out of the place, and uh, so I had to recycle it. So this is it in the recycling bin. This is a monument to aviation built by a Bauhausler, an innovator of aviation, had this giant hill made. He had a bit of money, so he was kind of like at the time of the Wright brothers. He built this big mountain out of earth and he used it to test his machines, kind of like the wooden wings, <laughs> those types of machines, early helicopters. So he'd run down the hill and, and try and get airborne. So on the top of this conical hill they built a, a giant globe out of uh, metal and then all the kids in the area started drinking there naturally so they started calling it the boiler room. This is a gravestone designed by a Bauhausler and uh, I was goofing around, put Oscar Schlemmer's a glove from Oscar Schlemmer's Triadic Ballet, coming out kind of a Michael Jackson thriller type of thing. Uh, this is on Teufelsberg, uh, where the German listening station, or the CIA listening station is. And it's neat because it's all, the whole mountain's made out of rubble, so sometimes there's parts of buildings poking out. And it's all on a hill, and right in the middle of the hill there was a little flat spot, and this giant orb was sitting on top of the, the earth. <laughs> Most of it's under the grass, but this one was kind of just sitting up on top. And then I went to Dessau, took a little trip to Dessau to check out the, uh, the most iconic Bauhaus school. Uh, and did a little tour of the master's houses, the gropiest design for all the masters of form. 
And this was kind of like the neat idea of, uh, of media being more important than the actual architecture. This was a stop on a tour at Gropius' house that he built for himself, but they tore it down and they're rebuilding it from scratch. So we stood in the rain while we did a tour and she showed us this picture of what the house looked like <laughs> while we stood there. And this is his office in the Bauhaus. And this was another example of uh, how important the models are to this type of thing. So we, we got into the office, which is pretty rare. You have to get a, a ticket with the tour to get into the office itself. And then while we were in there, she was explaining how the office worked, the different parts of it. And everyone was hovered over this model of the office inside it. So we're in the actual office. Instead of pointing out the real chairs, we're all hovered around this little model of the very room we were in. Kind of neat. And this is goofing around. This is uh, Walter Gropius' face coming through the wallpaper in his office. And now we're back in Winnipeg. So this painting is from a local curator, Colin Zip, had a show called uh, The Full Compliment that he put together in his nomadic gallery called One Night Stand Gallery. And he got all the uh, techs, the gallery technicians from the plug-in gallery uh, to put a show together. So in the, the theme of that, I kind of built what typically might be found in uh, the loading dock of a, of a gallery like that. So I got a little mini shipping pallet and a little bust and I put a plastic orange on, on his head there. And then I shrink wrapped it all up. And that was the, the priceless artifact in the little shipping dock. And I made a painting of that, kind of like a little still life. And then I had a video that went along with it, which was not really a video. It was kind of like a closed circuit television uh, TV camera loop. Not a loop, but a, a direct feed, more or less. So I had the little model was inside the plinth there with a little red light and the camera. And then uh, the, the cord from the camera came out through a little hole and went directly into the TV. So it wasn't recorded, but it was kind of a live feed. So if you shook it, the little more model would shake around in there. And that got me going on something that I had wanted to do for quite a while as a series of still lifes. So they're not necessarily uh, as influenced by the history of uh, modernist architecture as a lot of my stuff has been um, in the last few years. So I can branch out from that a little bit and kind of approach different things um, and experiment quite a bit. So it was nice. And I bought a whole bunch of three by three foot paintings for that. The nice size, it's fairly substantial on the wall, but also can work through ideas fairly quickly with that. And so this one's a piggy bank of an MCI bus crammed into the corner of a couch. We got a plastic vodka bottle torn in half with the little mountain top there and then the fridge with this little uh, kind of nicotine stained drips on it there. This one worked out pretty good, I think. It's kind of ambiguous. You're not exactly sure where it is or why. And this one showed in uh, the platform, last platform show called uh, All of a Sudden, the last one that just came down. That was, uh, Colin Zip was kind of making, he's the curator for that one as well. And he wanted to kind of highlight a dystopian kind of vision through all the works, kind of the moment of disaster, either right before it or directly after it. And so he picked this for that. That's my paintbrush holder. Mickey Mouse, plastic Mickey Mouse. This is from the old Shanghai building. Um, I got in there right before they tore it down in Chinatown. That's where my studio is. And it was weird. I was a bit of a time warp in there as well. All the suites in the top floor had been left untouched since 1977. And a lot of the stuff was still in them. It's like they'd all packed up to leave and uh, they only, and they just left half their stuff. So some of the kitchens are still set up with the food in them, like the dried food goods from then and all the, the daily items that they would be using. And one, on even like their uh, degrees, their university degrees were still up on the wall in a lot of cases, so you could go through one person's whole life. <laughs> but it, the one thing that every room had was a Santa Claus and a Mickey Mouse. So <laughs> this is very typical of the, that building. Here's a little um, ceramic horse with the legs broken off. 
the paint lid tin. So even if I want to do a painting of flowers, I have to kind of figure out a way to trick myself and do it as a still life of a tin with the little stickers on there and the scratches. And that brings us up to the current show, the one downstairs, Rebuild Them. And so the thesis I had for this body of work, the plan was, um, it was based on the early plan for the Bauhaus, kind of the Gropius's more utopian vision of um, all the workshops, so for glass, metal, textile, ceramic, all to have a painter as the master of form. So each workshop had a master of form, uh, which would be the, the more artistic visionary of the, of the masters, and then a kind of a, a technical master as well. So his vision was that painters had been building um, spaces inside the paintings, in abstract paintings for years. So they were more, um, they were more qualified than people who actually built physical objects to, for his new vision of uh, building um, basically the world. He wanted all these different workshops to go together and the ultimate, um, the ultimate thing that they could build would be a house. So everyone would work together to build a house or a, a living environment. And to him, painters were the ones most qualified to do it. So the painters like uh, Joseph Albers, Vasily Kandinsky, Paul Clay, and Lazo, Laszlo Maholi Nagy, or Nash. And um, so my idea was to take all the students' work I could find that had uh, this abstract um, painting theory kind of ingrained in them, real serious stuff, mostly about uh, squares, circles, and triangles having to be the, the right color. So I'd, and they were yellow, blue, and red, naturally. So a square had to be red, I think a circle had to be blue, and the triangle had to be yellow, and there was many reasons for this, and you could get it very wrong. If... So they wanted to experiment quite a bit, but there was also a lot of these strange rules that they had built into it. So anyway, I wanted to find the students' work that took a lot of these rules as the basis for their work, and find maybe um, architectural projects that they had done afterwards, or physical spaces, uh, that would be somehow based on this, these theories. I would document them once I found them, uh, build the little models of them, and then paint paintings based on that. So in a way, I would be taking the abstract painting theory, filtered through the student, through their physical work, and then translate it back into painting by building the little model and then painting from it. That was my plan. And I realized that I wanted to um, cover the basic structures that the Bauhaus went on to build or be influential in. And so in the early years, most of the, con um, the contracts they got were to build factories. Um, that was where the money was, and they had lots of uh, innovative ideas for building factories back then in their 19, 19 teens and the 20s. So this is of a factory that was built in 1927 by Otto Bartning. It's called the, pardon my German, Urwaltensbud der Elektrothermit. And uh, it was a, quite a big factory, and it was showing its age a little bit when I found it. And I kind of went around the back and found a little, in a parking lot, there was this beautiful um, relief wall that was kind of a little bit, a little bit roughed up, but it was a beautiful example of, of a nice detail that they'd put on a building, even though it was just a factory. So I took some flicks of that, and when I got back to Canada here in, in my studio in Winnipeg, I built a model of that. It's got the little bit of uh, safety tape around there. And there's the painting I did based on that. I did two paintings based on that factory. So this is of the uh, relief wall, poured cement relief wall, and the emergency tape. And this is another angle. This is uh, the roll down security cage, which I had built out of uh, pop or, uh, coffee stir sticks. And it had graffiti on it, much like most of Berlin. And this kind of showed the battle that the building had with buffing over the graffiti and then it coming back and then buffing over it and coming back. It kind of speaks to maintenance a little bit. How to keep these buildings going. This one is titled Opera House slash Casino. And this is uh, how the Bauhaus theories eventually filtered down into more of a 
kind of a postmodern building, kind of a tackier Las Vegas style structure. So maybe like a shopping mall kind of thing or a, a large entertainment center. And it would be built out of um, affordable materials so you get the best bang for your buck with these big flashy type of places. And uh, it's made out of cheese grater, so you got those nice little um, shielded windows from all the little cheese grater holes. And this one's kind of based, um, or a little bit of a nod to a Thomas DeMand painting called Model, 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 Model from, from 2000. And uh, his original one that he built was uh, based on a photograph of uh, Albert Spears, that's uh, Hitler's main architect. It was uh, his job was to put together how um, how the Germans would rebuild um, Germania, which would be the name for Berlin, because Hitler hated Berlin. He wanted to re tear it down and rebuild the whole place as Germania with huge um, huge monumental structures. So the the one that um, the, the the one that Thomas Demand used was a photograph of. Spears's um, large tower that he proposed for the 1937 Paris World Fair, and uh, and the, the power of the image was kind of like if you looked at it, it would be almost terrifying because that's what the world could have looked like if they had a succeeded a little more and started building these huge mega structures that would last the 10,000 year Reich. Um, so and that would be kind of terrifying. So I built one that had the same kind of angle of a table, a model on a table, in the, propped up with the uh, little sawhorses there. And it's a little terrifying too. It's what happened, what, the, what could have happened if the world were built like this, and it kind of was. So that's where I was going with that. And that takes us to the domestic space, the most important uh, part of uh, the Bauhaus building. So this is a uh, little corner of a condo, and this would be the update of, of their kind of idealistic building practices. A perfect machine for living out of affordable materials. And the ultimate goal. And this is the Mega Mega Project. This would be the uh, large-scale airport. So I built this one. This is a video. This is a still from a video. You can see that downstairs if you go check out the show after. And the airport terminals themselves are made out of jello lids, kind of jello forms. And uh, little ice cube trays are the little areas where the planes can go and dock up. And I cut a whole, whole bunch of teeny tiny holes in a big sheet of plywood and popped up uh, Christmas lights. So that makes all the runways. And there's various other white pieces of plastic, little bobs and odds and ends, all glued together to make the different outbuildings for the airport. And then I built uh, the wing, and this is kind of like if anyone goes traveling these days with, uh, with uh, social media, if they're going to go somewhere, they always post a picture out of the window of the wing. <laughs> Gone to Paris. So anyway, this is the, the view down the wing, and I built a little wing out of foam, pink foam, and mounted it to the bottom of the camera, and then I walked around in a circle several times, trying to mimic the the banking of an airplane as it drives, as it circles an airport, and then the little red lights would be blinking. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all for coming. That's very good.